Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Ask a Deaf Doula. Today, we have hospice nurse Julie. Julie, I'm going to read her bio. She may not need any introduction to you, and you are going to absolutely love her. Julie McFadden is a BSN RN and has been a nurse for 15 years. Julie is an experienced ICU and now a hospice and palliative nurse. Julie has been featured in Newsweek, USA Today, The Atlantic, and several other, other articles worldwide. Julie has been passionate about normalizing death through education to the masses using social media. And now her new book that's coming out in June, right now, soon, Nothing to Fear, and everyone should have a copy of this book. Her TikTok has 1.4 million followers, and you can find her on all the social platforms. She is an educator. We adore her. Julie, welcome to Ask a Death Doula. Oh my gosh, what an intro, girl. Thank you. Thank it's you. your intro. So you you have built such a beautiful platform and I am so happy to have this conversation with you and share you with everyone and just be able to step into this space together because this is the shift. You know, I know that you know that education is the tool. It's what, it, what changes the world. So your new book, Congratulations, by the way. Nothing to fear. Love the title. Love the title so much because there isn't. And we're going to get into that in a minute. But first, if I may ask you, how did you find your way to becoming a nurse? What was that path like? Oh, man, to becoming a nurse. That's a good one. So I was young and immature. <laughs> That's one. Let's start there. I already had a degree in psychology and I was working as a behavioral tech on a mental health unit in a hospital. And mm. a woman there had a seizure and fell right in front of me, cracked her head open, blood everywhere. And not nurse Julie was like, <gasps> like truly I was almost a second patient. I did not help her. I did not bend down. I barely got help. I was just so petrified. I yeah. was so scared that I ran away from her and ran and got the nurses. Um, and I could barely, I remember barely being able to get out like what had happened and mm. they were just like, and then they, I remember them taking off and running towards her, mm -hmm. looking down the hallway and seeing these nurses run towards this really scary event. And I remember thinking, I want to be that badass. I want to know what the hell to do when this happens. Now the woman ended up being okay, but she did have a seizure. She cracked her head open. She ended up going to a different unit. Um, but it was really scary. And that was my first thing of like, I want to be someone who can like run and help someone if they're bleeding. Mm -hmm. And my best friend at the time happened to be in an accelerated nursing program where if you already have your undergrad, you can get your second undergrad in nursing in three semesters. And like, that's just my personality. My personality is like, I got to go and I got to go hard and fast. Wow. <laughs> Sounds horrific, but you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and I just want to get it done. Like, I don't want to yeah. like go put that in four years of nursing school. So um, it was a competitive program and it took about a year to get into it. And I had to get prereqs and all these different things. And then I eventually got into the program. And then right when I started, it was like, boom, I love this. I did not know. I loved like science and biology and pathophysiology. Like but I loved it. I loved it. And that's how I got into nursing. Okay. Well, I love that, that story. I love that you're following like the path that's being put before you. However, that is presented. Talk to me about the ICU. Was that your first job that you went into? And how did that come about? Yeah, again, total ego, <laughs> total ego young. I finished nursing school. And in my mind, the ICU or the ER were like the best. Now, I don't, I'm not necessarily agree with that, but that's like what it felt like to me. Like, yeah, I'm gonna yeah, be, yeah. I'm going to go to the ICU for a couple of years. I might be a flight nurse. I am um, going to go back to for school, go back to school for anesthesia in a couple of years. Like I had a whole plan. Uh, yeah, to do. So I literally Googled number one hospital in the country. And at the time it was Johns Hopkins. So I, love it, girl. I applied for two different jobs there in the ICU. And of course, like, I think nursing, I could be wrong, but like, it wasn't hard to get a nursing job, even though everyone and even though all your professors at school act like it is, but I think nurses are always needed. Yeah. And I happened to, so I got, I got um, my first ICU job there. Okay. Lauren started in the ICU and like, it was a huge awakening, a huge yeah. rude awakening. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that like, wow, this is scary. This is hard. Yeah. This is a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
luckily we had a good orientation program. I was on orientation for six months, uh, fall. So a preceptor was constantly following me. And I remember thinking like, I'm going to be here for a year, two years. I'm going to go back to school. After two years of being in the ICU, I still felt new. I still felt like there's no way I could just like stop this now and go back to school. And, um, so it was just a rude awakening a little bit and it, and it eventually kind of really killed, killed my soul. Like I really, I learned so much and I was yeah. grateful for that, but like, it was not my cup of tea. And I didn't even realize that because I was so, I was so like blinders on just like, do it, do it head down. Yeah. And, let's, uh, let's talk about the ICU for a minute, because I think, and I know that there's no accidents in life. And I, I feel like for your education platform, you know, everything is so strategically divinely put out and the ICU really almost is the opposite of, you know, home natural care for people at the end of life, because when we don't plan ahead and when we don't talk about end of life and when the fear is so palpable and it's the number one fear in the world, the ICU is where we end up and the ICU. And so could you talk a little bit about what you saw there and, and then we'll talk about your journey to hospice. Yes, I couldn't agree more that when you don't plan and don't prepare, the ICU is where you end up. Um, my experience there, well, for, like you said, everything is like divinely guided. And I'm really glad that I had that experience because I think, be, and I'll talk about that in a second, but I do think because I was an ICU nurse, it makes me a really good hospice nurse because I, yes, I, I know the alternative. I agree. And mm-hmm. I'm able to speak about that to That's families right. so they understand it fully because I don't think That's most right. people do. That's but right. the ICU, it was a surgical ICU, meaning a lot of people got out of the ICU. So like in my, in the surgical ICU, you know, big surgeries, they're there for five days and then we ship yeah. them off to the, to the floor. But the things that I saw were, um, you know, people coming in for uh, terminal illnesses, right? Having big surgeries or the start of a treatment program, whatever. And mm-hmm. then instead of everything going well and them getting out of the ICU, it didn't go well and just complication after complication after complication. And we never, not always, I'm speaking generally here, but we just didn't have a good, we weren't good at saying enough is enough. Enough is enough. And we weren't addressing the fact that like, not only is enough enough, because we're having so many complications, we can't even get you out of the ICU. And now we have you on so many blood pressure medications to keep your blood pressure up that your toes are turning black because they're they're necrotic because we pumped all your blood toward the center of your body so you could survive. Um, but also you came in here with a terminal cancer diagnosis, like pancreatic cancer, you right. know, like no one's addressing that. And we're just, we're just like hoping we get other things and, or it just was so frustrating to me after years of finally seeing it, it took me years to even see that that's what we were doing. And then finally it was like, yeah, someone needs to talk about this. And I, I started I- yeah, I want to stop there for a minute if I can, because I, I love how how honest you are about things, because I think it, unless we really get things very clear about where we are at this moment, how do we make change going forward? And I think it's a multi-leveled answer to having that good end of life, the good death, is because when you said I, it's year, it was years, literally, like I was doing before I really realized what we were doing. Think about our doctors as well. It's like, we've taught them in the last hundred years, how to keep people alive. And we know how to do that. Like we can keep a heart beating. We can keep people breathing, but keeping people alive and living are two very different things. And ultimately it's for the person to decide what quality of life is for me. And that's going to be individual. And if I don't decide that it goes into that default. And that default can be something that in prolonged suffering. And like yeah. you just said, you're using an example of somebody who's not going to reverse their process, who is at the end of life, that things are happening and nothing's going to change that. So why aren't we talking about that more? And that's what I love about your book. There's nothing to fear because I think that's the first step is that we need to, what is this fear of end of life? So thank you for sharing about the ICU. Now, tell me about how you found your way to hospice. What was that transition like? It was um, just what we were talking about. It was a couple years, probably, I, I can't remember the exact time, but around two, three years, I started waking up <laughs> to like what, what I was doing in the ICU. And again, yeah. it's not always awful, right? There are, there's a time right. in the, of the ICU, right. but yes. there were specific patients that I would see that I'd be like, again, here we are, someone yeah. who is ultimately going to die. 
Yeah. Uh, not because of the ICU, because of right. what they came in for the ICU and, and no one's talking about it. So eventually I started being the one to talk about it in rounds. I would yeah. say, let's get together. Yeah. Let's have a meeting. We need to talk about what the future holds, what the go life goals are. Like, let's talk about that stuff. And I started seeing how I wasn't being hit with like, no, everyone, everyone in the rounds was like, yes, 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 yes. Okay. And they'd plan the meeting that day sometimes, and then things would change and the person would be taken off machines because the family finally understood what was really happening. And I started yeah. seeing, even though how sad, it, how, especially when you first start doing it, it can yeah. feel very heavy because you're like, I'm the only one who spoke up. I'm the one who got this meeting. Now they're dead it's because of me. Um, even though I knew it was right, it still was like hard at first, but I became more and more passionate about this is yeah. what I want to do. And I seem to be, I seem to have a good way, a, a good communication style to be able to do it. Yes, you do. So that's what made me start being like, I think I want to be a hospice nurse. Okay. Love this. Stay with this for one second, because when my background is an oncology nurse, and again, there's no accidents, when somebody had that, you know, end stage four cancer, they were not a DNR in the hospital. And you know what that means. You know that we have to resuscitate them. And, and here's the thing that I want to say, if we as medical professionals give any glimmer of a possibility that this person is not where they're at at the end of life, the family is going to grab onto that. Yeah. So we knew like you get very good at knowing when somebody's going to crash. And I would just like you go in and say, you have to go in and talk honestly with that family and let them know, or we're, we're going to be breaking their ribs for what and intubating them. And so I love that you stood up. You have a beautiful way of approaching this, but I also have found that honesty between the families, the people who are dying, and sometimes the medical professionals, there was like a breath of fresh air that somebody's actually saying this and addressing this. Oh, yeah. And by the way, this is a normal part of the life's journey and it can go really well when we do set it up. So Congratulations and kudos to you for being that person to speak in that space. Um, and then you said, okay, hospice feels like I I need, that's where I need to go. So tell me what that was like getting to hospice. So then I, I mean, there's a whole like journey yeah. to it, but in general, like I basically like took the plunge and just applied for hosp hospice mm -hmm. jobs. And they said you needed to have experience and I just applied anyway. And <laughs> I got a company to hire me because I think during the interview, I was like, listen, <laughs> this is what I want to do. I don't know anything about it, but I want to do this, please. And <laughs> thankfully they were nice about it. <laughs> I was really passionate about it. It was mm -hmm. like anything I do, I kind of do passion passionately yeah. once, I, once I realize what I want to do. Love it. Um, so they hired me, thankfully, and I had a really good doctor um, that was like associated with this hospice. And I would listen to her talk to our patients. A lot of the things that I rattle off my tongue in my videos are like legit, like verbatim stuff. She, I heard her say to our patients, like amazing how she, of life, how she talked about how the body helps us die. Yep. I was just learning so much, listening to her when I could follow her to face-to-face -face visits, they call them. Mm -hmm. It's not often, but sometimes I could. And it took me like a good year to really start physically seeing with my own eyes, how the body really does naturally just shut down a lot of times without us doing anything. Yes. And just like any other job you have, you see patterns. Like when I was an ICU nurse, I saw patterns. Yes. I could see things coming. I knew what was down the road. Yes. Same with hospice. You see these patterns, you can see yes. what's coming, you know how this works. And it was so fascinating to me. I get chills just thinking about it to see how yeah. like miraculous. I yes. know dying, but it feels miraculous because it's like, wow, the body really knows what's going on. It can help itself. Like, yes. Uh, and it was just so amazing to me. So I became it's, really, really, I happy. love that. Yeah. I love that you share that. It's such a natural, the body is so smart, right? It's natural. And this is what struck me is that when I worked in different places in the world with hospice, we all die the same way. So the body shuts down the same way, whether again, you're on a dirt floor in a hut in Zimbabwe, or you're in a mansion in Millbrook. And this is really important. I think this awareness is so important for us to know how much more similar we are than different in a time that everyone is so divided and pointing fingers. Let's talk about, okay, so we're going to go into beautiful things about end of life, but let's talk about the fear. Julie, let me ask you this question. For something that's 100% guaranteed part of our journey, all of us. 
where do you, and it's the number one fear in the world, death. Where do you think that came from? How did we get there? How do we get here with this? Well, one, I mean, I think the unknown with anything is always scary for anyone. I think people really like to know, every, like the, the unknown is just scary in general. Okay, yeah, I agree. It's humans, it's unknown. And I think because we are in this modern day medicine, which is a beautiful, beautiful yes. place, we can stay alive longer, but um, death has been taken out of the home and brought into the hospital. Yes. Um, and instead of it's like, instead of like someone's dying, let's go to the hospital. It's like someone's dying. Let's go to the hospital. So they don't die. Right. And a lot of times they don't, or, you know, it's just death used to be like in the house. Death mm -hmm. used to be like not an emergency. Death used to be like the family was around and you would have wakes and funerals in homes. Yes. And I don't even mean that, that we need to go and do that again. Uh, that would be kind of cool. I think in my head, but in general, because of that, people don't see it now. Right. And people have stopped seeing it. So mm -hmm. now it's been like hidden. Yeah. And then also other things have been living has been glorified. And like, that's like the ultimate thing you have to always survive. Um, and people yeah. just don't know, people don't know what they don't know. You know, so yeah. many people write to me, my, my loved one looked like this and looked like this and looked like this when they were dying, they were suffering so much. I'm traumatized. And then I read what they wrote. And not to take it away from them, I understand why they felt traumatized, but it's because they didn't know what death looked like. Their of loved ones were suffering. Everything right. you saw, the changes yeah. in breathing, the death rattle, the open eyes, the open mouth, that's all yeah. normal. You just never see it. That's right. That's right. Okay. So we're, we're going to go with that. So I, my mom calls it the perfect storm and she's right. Like we got here because we've turned death into a medical experience and it's not, it's a human one. And we've yeah. outsourced it to, and we've, we've actually put a very impossible task on our doctors to fix it because yeah. we know that you can't, no matter what you do. In fact, there's that very dangerous gray area that you sometimes cause more harm or suffering prolonged than not. So this is really important that we get together, but what do you think about the language we use as medical professionals around death? You know, she lost her battle with cancer. Cause if it's a battle, if death is a battle, we're all going to lose eventually. And so maybe we've set up the wrong, we've really set this up to be something feared. Um, but I also will always remind us that we've been dying for thousands of years. We, we know how to do this, right? We've just forgot. I think it's in the last like 120 and you pointed that out. Yeah. I feel like we are robbing people of a dying experience. We are, we now, some, of course, like we're speaking generally again, people who are shot general, or yeah. whatever, yeah. like accidents, things like that. But I mean, in general, with our medical system, we're robbing people of that dying experience, just like a yes. birth experience. It can be That's sacred right. and beautiful. And That's I right. think another like little soapbox I can get on is like people need time. Like doctors need time to yeah. and nurses need time to be able to talk to patients about a really um, yes. Sometimes complicated, sometimes really scary thing. And then yes. the time. So how are we going to hurry up and care? How are we going to hurry up and tell someone that they're dying and they should do X, Y, and, and that's why I think we don't do it because here's the that's thing. Like, they're, it. Literally, they're literally given 15 minutes. Like they're literally told you have 15 minutes for this conversation on this visit. If I walk in there and I say to somebody, you're at the end of life, that is like an hour to start with conversation and then there's more to it. So guess what? Nobody's, and it's, no and you know what happens when we don't address this? It robs people of final goodbyes, of being at home, of all of the beautiful things. So death is a sacred experience, just like birth. Yes, it's very different, but we're not doing anything to prepare and have those plans, just like we had said. And yet there's so much importance and beauty. And for something that's 100% guaranteed, it's not like, oh, maybe half of us, or maybe we'll do it, maybe we won't. All of us will. And as in, and you can say what you feel, but in my opinion, from the people that I've been with, 80 to 90% of a positive end of life was when they did plan ahead, when they knew what they wanted, when they were at home, when their family was supported. And we're denying them when we don't talk about this and we don't say, let's plan on it. And these are your options. You're denying that to be and your your platform and your book is helping to bring this awareness back so that people can take this back into the sacred natural experience it's meant to be amazing exactly i mean that's uh i even the people who like even the people who are angry who are yeah. who say they're scared who say yeah. they don't want to die 
even those people, the fact that they're just saying that out loud gives them a better death. Like, it's not like people who have a better death and who plan it. It's not like they're, they have it all together. They don't. But the fact that they even did it always makes for a better death. Always. Just like birthing. Like you have a birthing plan. Does it always go? No, it doesn't always go the way it's supposed to go. But at least you have a blueprint. And at least, you know, you have something to go by. So let's talk about the sacredness of death if we can. And let's talk about the natural because we've really laid into that. And I really feel that this is the moment that those of us who work within the space are being asked to share those stories, the truth about those stories and like what makes that better end of life or what we've seen. One of the things that has always surprised me as I've been as a hospice nurse, there have been times that I've gone in and the family says, don't tell them you're from hospice. Don't tell them you're dying. And I'd go, in, I'd say, why not? And they said, because they can't handle it. And I've gone into the person, they say, don't tell my mom I'm dying. And I say, why not? And they said, because she can't handle it. We deny those final conversations, but there's a reality here within our system about how much time practitioners can actually be in the homes and that the family is actually the one who's doing the care. And you just said it, people usually have not seen end of life. So what they're seeing petrifies them and they're very scared. And when we tell them that these are natural signs and symptoms, how the body's shutting down, that alone can change that entire experience. But I want it, so that's from the practical standpoint, but I wanna have a heart-centered conversation with you about some of the sacredness that we've been privileged and honored to see. I know that when I started working with those at the end of life, my life completely changed. I felt like I was connected to something so much greater than me. Your families, the love that they like instantaneously, the appreciation, but then also the things that our end of life patients have shared with us, some of the things that we have seen completely in my, like changes the whole game of this life. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that bedside visioning um, some of your experiences, because I think the more that we can even just share that these things do happen, it allows people to open up a space that maybe I don't have to be so afraid, or maybe there is more. And again, I'm never telling someone what they need to believe, but the more that we can be honest about this natural experience and what's happening, um, I think it can actually really help to change our world in general. Yeah. So what, what have you experienced or what were some pivotal moments with patients that you were like, wow, that shifted me. So I'll get to like the really crazy ones, right? Where there's okay. like, but, but I think the, the main thing that's really changed me that isn't, that isn't, that might seem a little boring, but I don't think it is, is the true connection. There's something about people yeah. being vulnerable just in life in general, like the vulnerability yep. yes. of humans. And then connecting in that way, even just meeting someone and their family, yeah. and explaining what to expect when they're dying. And then having people think it's depressing. Almost every single person in their family will have a look of relief on their face that someone's finally yes. saying the word, what it's going to be like to die, saying the word yes. death. They yes. can ask the hard questions. They get a look of relief. Like, oh, thank of you. Of course they do. Um, yes. die. Yeah. Um, on, on what it's like, or I had a, I had a patient once who was dying. He was dying. I mean, everyone on hospice is dying, but like he was getting really close. And I went to go visit him on follow-up and he grabbed my hand and we were just chit-chatting. He grabbed my hand and said, out of all the people I meet today, I'm so glad I met you. Just things like that, where you're like, I can't, my heart instantly explodes. I'm like, yeah. The, yeah. like it's not the human to human connection. The love you talk about. Yeah. Seeing the love, I remember yes. seeing someone take the end of life medication, which is medication that's not legal everywhere, but it is legal in the state I work in California. Someone drinks medication and then, yeah. you know, they eventually die 45 yeah. minutes later, but they go unconscious really quick. So he drinks his medication and he basically goes to sleep. And in that moment, I literally saw his yes. family lean over him and like cocoon this man in love. And like the feeling it feels like is like a magical Yes. I'm in a, I'm in a space that's bigger than me. Something about this love that I am witnessing in this moment of this cocoon of love around this man dying is it makes me want to weep. Yes. Tears of joy because in tears of something, I don't know. It's, I don't know what it is. Tears of something that yeah. it's, it's, it's bigger than us. And that's the shit that makes me believe in something greater. Than yes. Me. Woo! Chills, chills. <laughs> chills and I don't always get chills and it's so true. 
Yes. So this is what I believe, because again, from my experience as hospice, like we're holistic beings and we're literally four bodies of energy, the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And I really believe, because I've sat bedside with so many people at that very end, as their physical part of them is diminishing, right? The personality, the ego, their spiritual body is growing. And that's where I feel like they get, they have one foot in this world and one foot in the next. And that's why they can see loved ones who've died before. And that's where they can see where they're going, but they can still talk to you. But just what you described, this love, this unconditional loving presence. And for me, sometimes actual time has like disappeared. Like, yes. yeah, yes. like I, I've walked out of homes and said, okay, what day is it? Like, what? Time, where are we? Because time does not exist in that frequency. And, you know, this is, this is measured by physics. Like physics, quantum physics is validating that everything is energy. And at the end of life, we our energy changes its frequency. I mean, this is this is so important to share because this, I literally always say that. I always go when someone takes their last breath, it's like time stands. Yes, still. yes, like time stands still, and I get the same feeling yes. like a baby being born. Time yes. stands still. Oh, I know. We chills all over because. So, Julie, what would happen? What would the world be like at this moment? If people understood this sacredness of this part of the journey, and then what does that mean about what this life's journey is all about? Right. How does that change? If there is something so much greater, if it's unconditional love, if people at the end of life are saying so many of the same things that they want you to know, how does that, if we bring that back into our awareness in our world, how does that change the way we are interacting and living today each day with each one of us? Right. I, changes everything right the main the first thing i thought of was freedom because i think when you're in fear you're not living in like freedom and grace yeah. and this idea that like this moment that we're in is precious and we have a choice to like see sometimes i feel like the veil is lifted right all of a sudden yep my veil is lifted and yep. I'm like seeing the world for what it really is, which is like, whoa, amazing. And like, I can be grateful in every moment, uh, uh, all these amazing things. My lungs are working. My legs are working. Uh, so I think understanding that in living best we can in that moment, in the moment to moment, it's like a freedom exists there. I always people ask people to contemplate. If you're going to die, let's say you're going to die in six months, contemplate that, which most people are like, Ugh, but that's not what it's supposed to. If you can really understand that, you can feel free because guess what? You're not dead yet. But knowing that you may die sometime, and it yes. can be soon, right? Yes. It can kind of help you see what really matters to you specifically, right? Is it family? Would you quit your job? Who would you talk to? Who would you stop talking to? What would, what would be the things you'd want to do differently if you knew that this, that this was a reality? And yes. it is, it is and a reality, it is. but like, uh, but okay. if you don't put it in a time, if you don't put it yeah. like in six months, people can't get it. Do you know what exactly. I mean? Yeah. And you know, the, the, okay. So they say that the death is the number one fear. And I totally understand that. But for me and and all the people that I've worked with, I really felt like it was more the regret that they they got their terminal diagnosis and they didn't live this life, just like you're saying, with the opportunity, the appreciation, the awareness, the gifts of all that it offers us. And it does. So when you said looking at it with free, the freedom, and I love that, what about the peace that it brings in? And what about like when we talk about being the physical body, the personality, Suzanne, Julie, but then being the heart centered soul self, which we see at the end, if we knew that we could access that and look at the world through that love and compassion, I mean, woo, and that's, that's the teaching, right? Yeah. Right there. Just said it. That, yeah. I don't know. That was perfect. How, if we could, if we could access that, the heart centered self, the access of, that's of it. to look at the world through that lens. That's it. Live through that lens. Every day. Okay. Every moment of what we do through the lens of love, not wait till the end of life where we do get it organically, get it now because we can, and that's a choice. And you said that it's a choice. And also for me, when I started working with those at the end of life, it wasn't that, oh, I got to go work out. It was like, I get to go exercise. I get to go to the grocery store. And I, I try and live every day like one little lifetime because I know one day it will be the last day that I'm in this gift. Now, 
Let's talk about bedside visitations because I want to talk about grief for a minute. We know that we have this insane amount and we understand it, global traumatic grief naturally, because if we're not talking about end of life and then it shows up, it usually doesn't go that well because we're kind of scrambling. Then people have their end of life and they're stuck in this grief. But with people saying that they see their loved ones who've died already, and this is a very common thing. So from a practical standpoint, it lets you know, to me, their frequency is getting closer. Now they have one foot in this world, one foot in the next. But what does that mean? What is that saying on a bigger, just if it is true? And I will tell you that I a thousand percent believe it because I've been with people on no medication with oxygen saturations that were amazing, verbatim telling me what they see. What does that tell us about the bigger picture of this experience? Yeah. 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 So well, I think, that, I think that even in a, even, even if we want to be like very gray and very PC, I think it tells us that we just don't know, right? We just don't know, but it, but it sounds but it sounds good, but what if, whatever it is. But what if, like, and, and right. And so even just talking about these comfort measures right. um, and from an energetic standpoint, again, if you want to go back to quantum physics and I have studied it because we ha I had to like dive in it. There's really a lot of validation that things are on a, a frequency and there's just a lot going on here. But I feel like just knowing that how common this experience is, is something that is so comforting and can bring us peace. So exactly. you know, that's what I mean. Like, I believe it, but I also like to bring in like the people, sure. who, like, like, like the skeptics, right? Like, even if it's because of, because of something, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. great. It's still something that is built in that, that helps us feel more at ease and more comforted, like end of story. And I, and I, and I've seen it so often. Yeah. And, and what I like to say is like, we don't know why it happens, but I know why it doesn't. Like, I know what's not causing it and what's yeah. not causing it is medication, lack of oxygen, yeah. because people, most people that I have seen do that are not that close to death. Like they are really, yeah. And okay. not taking many medications, not on a bunch of stuff. And mm -hmm. they clearly tell me what's going on. So it's very specific. And I wouldn't really, like when I was an ICU nurse, I didn't see that much, but as a hospice nurse, I see it all the time. And I see it even more now because I educate people about it. Cause I think it's yep. important that families understand that this is kind of like a timeline and we can kind of see what's where the trajectory is going. If, sure. if people, yeah, yeah. yeah. And because I say it, I think it gives people freedom to go, that's already happening to me. You know, I didn't want to tell you, yes. but that's already happening. And so now I really hear stories yes. because people actually are willing yeah. to share. And it's so, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's so funny because I had this one nurse and you know, us nurses, we're not the best patients. I'll just kind of put it out there. I know that I'm not, but, um, she was, and she was very ill and she had a lot of children. She was really angry because she was bed bound and she, you know, she didn't, didn't want anyone to talk to her. And I remember coming in this one day and I said, how are you doing? And she went, and I was like, and I said, are you having any pain? She's like, and that was totally new for her. And I was like, she saw loved ones last night. And of course she died that night. But anyway, this is a common thing. And I want to talk about one other thing that has always been such a beautiful awareness to me is how I've had people wait for certain dates or people to leave the room, even when they're in their deep sleep coma, the five minutes in the hospital, whatever that is for them to actually have their end of life. Can you share with me that have you had those experiences and what you think may be happening there or how common that is? Yeah. I had a woman who was, I have, I have, a, I have a few experiences, but I'll tell you two, if I have time. Okay. Uh, I had one woman who, what I thought was fascinating was um, she was very elderly. She was in her nineties. And when I saw her that day, when I admitted her onto service, she was like the matriarch of the family, tons of family already in the house. She was dying that day. She was actively dying. So yeah. unconscious changes in breathing, death rattle. Like she was actively dying, could have died that day. Mm. Um, this woman held on for three weeks, okay. three weeks, actively dying, unconscious the whole time, no food and water in her nineties because she was waiting for every frigging person in her family to get to the house, flying in from places. And she did. And she waited till every single person was there. The house had like 50 people in it. Legit. What? Yes. Which and science would tell you is impossible that she lasted that long. 
Yes. Like yes. they're like, they're without food, without water at that age. There's no oh, way. Without water, actively dying for three weeks, fully unconscious, no food or water. And then on top of that, being elderly, I do feel like younger right. people maybe can do, but she was in her nineties. Yeah. She was in her nineties. I and love that. She, uh, waited the whole entire time. The other one that was, that was insane to me was a woman came on that was like borderline appropriate. You know, the type she yeah. was elderly. She was like, had COPD. She was like, kind of, kind of appropriate. Maybe she was going to die in six months. Maybe not like, uh, but we put her on service. Yeah. Um, and I, she had a caregiver and then her son who was like mentally handicapped to the caregiver also cared for. Mm -hmm. And a week later, I got a call to go do a death visit for her. And I was like, what? this lady was like, barely, not barely sick, but you know, you know, the type where you're like not expecting it at all. So I go there and I see the caregiver kind of like, what happened? You know? Yeah. And the caregiver's like, you are not going to believe this. Last night we were making some kind of muffins. Like we always do every Sunday or whatever it was. Yeah. And at the end of the night, she went to bed and she called me over and she started like basically saying sweet nothings to me. I love you. Thank you. Promise me. You're going to take care of my son. Promise me you're going to take care of your son. Like everything's planned out. You can have the house, like all these things. And this lady and her caregiver's like, what are you talking about? Like, I'll see you tomorrow. Relax. She was like, no, I'm tired. I'm dying tonight. Um, promise me you'll take care of my son. And so she just said like, okay, like what the heck? Yes, of course I'll take care of your son. Call my son in here. Calls a son. Says a bunch of sweet nothings to him. I love you, blah, 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 blah. Okay, good night, mom. The next morning, dead. Julie. I know. <laughs> Julie. I love this. I love you. I love you sharing these stories. I have something similar that I had this, and it was like one of those things. This woman had dementia. I saw them every Tuesday. Um, it was her and her husband, but they lived with their, with their daughter. They lived upstairs in the thing. I would go routinely this particular day. She was more alert and her vitals were better than they ever have been. And so the man used to follow me down to the car. I used to give him a little report. We used to talk about it. And I remember when I was leaving her and I said, okay, I'll see you next Tuesday. She goes, and when I went down to the car and I finished talking with the gentleman, I said, okay, I'll see you next Tuesday. And he went, hmm. and she died. She died two days later. Like, like people. So these things, there's so much going. So what I want people to know, and I think you do, there's so much more going on. I feel like in this beautiful experience that we're gifted and when we come to that heart centered place of you, of this experience, human beings, and we talk about it and we support each other, that's how we change the world. Yeah. There is nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear. So tell me about this book and how we can get it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. My book, nothing to fear. Um, can I say something really quick about the title? I love the title. <laughs> and I think, I think my publishing company made, made the right choice, but I also kind of fought for normal to fear because it's so normal to fear. And just because you fear it doesn't mean you need, you can't talk about it. Right. Yes. So, uh, we can, we can also cut that out if you don't want to, but I love talking about that. Cause I think it's, it's also like normal and nothing. Yeah. Normal and nothing. Right. But so nothing yes. to fear is, is, uh, is my baby. And it's a book just to help educate. I think, I think education and knowledge about the dying process is what's really going to help decrease that fear that we have for death. So, um, it's a book that's like not meant to be read cover to cover. It doesn't have to be, it can be like, you want to read about X, whatever this chapter, you can turn to any chapter and kind of educate yourself and learn about it with my stories of being a hospice nurse and an ICU nurse kind of woven in there. So it's not just like a textbook, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's just supposed to help demystify death to live more fully. You know, I don't know how you feel, but I feel like hospice is about living, you know, hospice is about living, not about dying. It's about how to like live out the rest of your life. Um, Julie, I've yeah. seen more good work done in the last six months in life at times than I have in 30 years. And why is that? Because people are like, oh, mom is going to die. Let's put down the cell phones. Let's get to the conversations. Let's live in the present moment. And that's the teaching for all of us, right? If we live like ah, death is optional, one day I'll get to it or whatever, then we're not living. We're not living. And so you're right. It's about living and just the awareness that one day this journey, as we know it, will not be the same. 
puts a whole different lens on the appreciation and what you're going to do with your time, which is your most valuable commodity is your time and how you choose to spend it. So, so excited about this book. Everyone should have it. I want to thank you so much for being a guest on Ask a Death Doula. We have all the links below, everyone. Follow Julie, get that book and can't wait to have you on another episode. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. And thank you for all you're doing. I love it. (laughs) Thank you, my dear. I love you so much. All right, everyone. This was Ask a Death Doula with Julie McFadden. We will see you in the next episode. Thanks, everybody.